You know, in that documentary, they asked me what I wanted. I said to live to be at least 100. Now I know why I have to live up to Margot's <laughs> introduction. <laughs> um, I thank you so much for inviting me here into this great room full of good hearts and great minds and uh, true, true ability to, and will to, to change the world. I understand I'm the first non-Canadian that you have <laughs> invited, so I should just tell you I am a secret Canadian. <laughs> uh, I have often come here under stress from the U.S. to ask for asylum. <laughs> um, and I have uh, actually a history here because at the very beginning of the women's movement when I was terrified to speak in public and especially on the media. I say this in case some of you have the same problem because you do learn that you don't die. Uh, <laughs> I, I came here because I didn't know anyone here. And I thought if I tried to do television here and I totally messed up, no one would know. None of my friends would know. And so I came here uh, at uh, the very, I think about 1970, and did a series of interviews together with Patrick Watson. Um, and that played a great role in my life because it did take away the fear at least a, a, a little bit. And I have come for Leaf and Dr. Henry Morgenthaler and so many of, of the groups here. And now I come because I do know people. I know Michelle Landsberg here, who, I mean, anybody would want to be in the same town with Michelle Landsberg and Stephen Lewis, right? And because, <laughs> uh, who's been writing the revolution for a very long time and now has a book called Writing the Revolution. And then I had to come because Karen Lippert, who put Ms. Magazine on the map for many years, my colleague, moved here. And I was so jealous of the fact that you had her. And now Margot. <laughs> And there are so, so many people here who mean so much in my life. So I, I really feel I have a history here, but I also have to tell you I have never, ever, ever come with more feeling of pleasure and satisfaction than to celebrate the Canadian Women's Foundation. It is a star, a bright star of the global women's funding movement. When we first began, all of all corporate, uh, philanthropic, private giving altogether, only about one to five percent went to projects for women and girls. So it was absolutely crucial that we increase that amount of funding, and it is still crucial. But it's also become apparent that besides going in 20 years from $40,000 a year to $4 million in grants, I mean, you know, is that fantastic? <laughs> it, is, it is so important because this foundation is so well run and so trusted and so aware of how to do something magic that very few foundations understand which is to create independence, not dependence, to understand how to give money in that way. So I salute you, I thank you, I thank you for being an inspiration, and I understand very well that the reward here is uh, to be together in this room, yes, uh, for me to get to see you, yes, but the reward was in that film when that young woman said, thank you for my life. That is the true reward. It, I think it brought tears, right, to a lot of us. Um, now, it seems to me that um, among the secrets of success for the foundation and for all women's endeavors in many ways is an understanding that, yes, God is in the details, as they say, right? but the goddess is in the connections. The goddess <laughs> is understanding that our goal is to be linked, but not ranked. Our goal is to return to the circles in which we sit here and to get out of the pyramid structure 
that arrived actually when Europeans, the pioneers of patriarchy, <laughs> arrived on this subcontinent and began to replace what had been layers of circles as forms of governance with hierarchy, pyramid, labels. Labeling is the enemy of connection. So I would just like to cite a few ways in which I think we still are making those connections and getting the social justice movements themselves out of silos, you know, out of thinking about the women's movement, the anti-racist movement, the environmental movement, the gay and lesbian movement. That's all very important because it's a process of becoming visible. But it also, by the very labeling, sometimes keeps us from seeing the connections. For instance, when I'm on campus, as I often am, speaking on several a month, sometimes students say to me, um, why is it that the same right-wing groups are against feminism, uh, against, say, against lesbianism, and against birth control? <laughs> <You know? laughs> that seems odd on the face of it, right? <laughs> but in fact, they understand the connection, and so we should understand the connection. They understand that their point of view is all sexual expression is only moral and okay when it can end in conception. Therefore, any forms of contraception or any forms of human love for each other uh, that does not symbolize conception, love between two women, between two men, they understand that they are against all of that. And we need to understand that those connections are for us too. There's a reason why the women's movement has always arisen at the same time as a movement for gay and lesbian rights, whether it was in Germany between World Wars I and II where there was a huge women's movement, the biggest in the world, and more women as part of the Bundestag than any place in any other parliament uh, and a huge gay and lesbian rights movement and the National Socialists, the authoritarians, rose against those two movements and came to power specifically calling for, what was it, Kinder, Kirka, I can never say it right, but anyway, church, hearth, <laughs> children, against freedom for women and uh, against uh, any idea that there was any goal for uh, sexuality except the creation of, of the master race. Um, I'm afraid that in our last national election in my own country, when we had the kind of special torture of having two firsts at the same time, uh, <laughs> of having both Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, the press greatly increased on this continent the lie, the utter lie of saying that sex and race are separate. And not only separate, but competitive. The idea was who should come first. It was so, so destructive. We are still mending from this terrible division. Because the truth is that racism is a major, major motive for controlling women as the means of reproduction. You have to control women's bodies in order to maintain a visible difference, racial separation, as if there were such a thing as race, which of course there is not. We all came from Southern Africa. We, race is a very minor adaptation to climate. And yet we find ourselves with these terrible kinds of labels and those labels increase wherever uh, the, the labels for women increase wherever there is racial division. There's a reason why single race countries, say in Scandinavia, are more advanced in women's rights than those with strong systems of racism around the world. Uh, and we must recognize that and understand that we are acting always, we must act in, in coalition. 
uh, there's supposed to be a difference between um, the a kind of fatal difference almost, perhaps that's a pun, between the young and the old, I guess it's a pun. <laughs> but, I, and I fear sometimes that we replicate this division ourselves within our own movement because there are millions and millions of women who worked so hard and with so little reward in this movement. And in a way, because they were not rewarded, as they should have been, are now trying to extract gratitude from young women. It's sort of like, you know, I walk 30 miles in the snow to school, you know, <laughs> and you didn't. You know. <laughs> well, it's true, you know, we all, we should have been rewarded. But it's also true that gratitude never radicalized anybody. I didn't walk around saying, thank you for the vote. No, <laughs> I got mad on my own behalf. And the, the truth is that younger women experience the same discrimination uh, and get angry, but for different reasons and different forms. We were angry about the criminalization and the great danger that came from, from criminalized abortion. They, in my country at least, are very angry about uh, no sex education in the schools, uh, about no insurance payment for prescription birth control, uh, you know, all kinds of issues, because they are the issues that they experience. But we are all unified by our mutual quest for reproductive freedom. It just took, takes different forms, right? But we are all seeking reproductive freedom as a fundamental human right, as basic as, hu as freedom of speech, maybe more basic. We are fighting around the world women's movements, whether they are against female genital mutilation or th the ability to have a child or the ability not to have a child. We are all fighting for reproductive freedom and a principle, a new human rights principle, that says that the power of the state stops at our skins. That we and we alone can decide when and whether to have children. Now, the single greatest force for uh, population control, so-called, on this earth is women. Hello, you know? We do not want to have five children from you know, 13 onward with child marriage and lose our teeth and lose our, you know, our lives. The single greatest com determinant of whether we're healthy or not, how long we live, um, are we uh, educated or not, are we active outside the home or not, all those things are determined by our ability to decide when and whether to have children. We have a record number of billions of people on this earth right now. It is a human load this planet cannot continue to carry. It is a, a, a principle of survival of, of this spaceship Earth on which we live and we love so much that women are able to establish reproductive freedom. And yet are we perceived as part of the environmental movement, the most important part of the environmental movement? Not very often. The women have always been 80% at least of the environmental movement because of our feelings about this and our connections with nature since nature is dictated by man and we are too. We have a kind of special feeling for nature. <laughs> we, but the leadership of our environmental movements is by and large the paid visible spokespeople out there are by and large not females and I don't think the women's movement is still generally perceived as the fundament, the true fundament of, of the environmental movement. So, you know, wherever we look, there are connections that we must make. And we make them in the way that we always must, which is in our lives first. You know, revolutions are built uh, like houses from the bottom up, not from the top down. Uh, so the question is, what can we do about this? Well, take for example racial, or, uh, take for example, I think we understand that if all of our friends look alike, 
we're missing something, right? <laughs> but we perhaps don't understand or understand less that we can do something profound about the so-called generational uh, division. Uh, for instance, I think we ought to examine the word mentor. The word mentor connotes a one-way street. I have discovered that I learn much more from young, or as much at least, from younger women as they learn from me. And in the internet age, that's even more clear. <laughs> they understand how to organize in all kinds of ways that I, that I don't. So what do we do about this in our daily lives? Well, every time we're going to um, a meeting or a, any kind of event, or place to which perhaps younger women don't yet have access, we can bring a younger woman with us. And every time a younger woman is going to a concert or an instant demonstration or whatever it is that she uh, or he has access to and we don't, we can say, would you take me along? So, you know, we need to build this kind of change truly from, from the, the, the bottom up. And, you know, together we can brainstorm all kinds of, of other examples, but at a minimum we can look at the so-called other movements, the gay and lesbian and transgender movement, the environmental movement, the movement against racism, and understand that when we work together, we're not looking for thanks or gratitude, we're doing it for ourselves. It is an intrinsic part of our own welfare and our own motivation. But I want to speak also for a minute because you are so um, importantly focused on, on violence against women, uh, especially about the divisions that are missing there. I, I think we don't yet understand that the degree of violence in the household is the it can be, is the exact predictor of the amount of violence in the street and in foreign policy. If violence is not normalized in the home and in the family, it is not seen as an acceptable way of solving conflict. If it is normalized in your childhood, in your own family, it becomes not only an acceptable way, but an inevitable way. You think that it's part of human nature, and this is not true. It, there are the, the, the land on which we sit uh, that I think is part of what both we all, the, the nations of the Iroquois Confederacy, what we call the Iroquois Confederacy, the indigenous nations that were here, had a different form of government that had to do with consensus and rising levels of consensus. Indeed, they didn't even have gender in their languages that is, gendered pronouns in their languages. There was no word for nature because they didn't feel they were separate from nature. Sometimes I think we should think about history vertically, you know, that if you think about it laterally, it seems too far away, but if you go out and touch rocks and walk on land and look at the horizon and understand that um, a few centuries ago, it's much closer for us on this continent than on, on many others in the Middle East, only five or six hundred years ago, people had different forms of government without the ideas of race and gender, without these kind of divisions. So, you know, we need to connect the idea of um, violence in the home to violence in public life, and we need to make those connections. We need to say to our creators of policy that every single dictator in the world that I have been able to study, from, from Hitler as the classic example, through Saddam Hussein, through Ceausescu in Romania, every single one of them was sadistically abused as a child and came to believe that there was no other way of behaving or solving conflict. I think as basically as children and as human beings, we experience empathy. When we see someone else in trouble, we try to help them uh, because empathy is part of our evolutionary equipment. The species couldn't have survived unless we had that feeling that we wanted to help a member of our species. 
when the um, Good Samaritans during World War II, the people who helped Jews, even though they themselves were not Jewish, at the risk of their own lives, when they were studied after the war, as everyone wanted to replicate them, so everyone studied them, the question was, what was their shared characteristic? Because what they said was so much the same. They all said, I'm not a hero. I don't know why I did it. I just did it. I just didn't think of not doing it. Uh, and it, was it religion? Was it education? Was it family structure? And the single most shared characteristic was that they had not been abused as children that the leap of empathy from one human being to the other had not been interrupted by a deep and uh, conviction that there were only two choices, to be the victim or the victimizer. Then the gender roles come along and create um, a division in which men tend to be the victimizers and women tend to be the victim because of gender, but the root cause of, of um, abuse and pain in childhood is the same. It is no less than the, uh, our ability to survive on spaceship Earth, that you are doing this work of, of trying to stop violence in the home, to denormalize violence in the home, to stop the crimes of um, the, in both of our press, they're often called senseless crimes, you know, because they're not for uh, money or even stealing a pair of sneakers or, you know, it's your, it's the Montreal massacre. Um, it's just the same recent cause of the murder in Scandinavia where he said, just like in the Montreal massacre, I'm murdering women and he went after uh, younger women and blamed feminism for women not having enough children and therefore people were coming in, Arabs were coming in. You, you know, it's the crimes of, of um, going into um, post offices and schools and just shooting. Uh, it's the um, serial sadistic crimes. Every single one of them as far as I've been able to determine, has been committed by a man, by a white man, and by a man who is not poor. Now, if, if every single one had been committed by a person of color or by a woman, we would hear about it, right? But we don't. It's mostly headlines that say, what's happening to our children? What do you mean our children? You know, this is a specific group. And it is a group who, through no fault of theirs, men have been born into a system of male supremacy, and it causes some men to get hooked, addicted, like a drug to supremacy. When they aren't in control, they and other elements are, are present. It's not a single element, but it's the most important element of, of the cult of masculinity they then respond uh, in panic with murders and even tortures to exert that control. I think we ought to name them supremacy crimes. It's what they are. And they stretch from the battering husband or partner all the way through the sadistic dictator but they really are supremacy crimes. They have no other rationale. They're not for food to eat. They're not for money. <laughs> They're not for position. They are for the addiction to male supremacy. And finally, I, I, uh, I, I debated about whether I should say this or not, and now I have even less time to say it, but why not? I'll just <laughs> say it right <laughs> I think we have to really look seriously at the politics of religion. It is supposed to be off limits, you know, uh, but the fact of the matter is that spirituality is one thing, politics is too often something different. I mean, uh, religion is too often some, something different. It's politics in the sky. 
And we have to think seriously about the reasons why God always looks like the ruling class. <laughs> Didn't you wonder when you were little why Jesus had blonde curls and blue eyes in the middle of the Middle East? I mean, you know. <laughs> and actually, uh, if, you, if you read the Gnostic Gospels, you see that, God, that Jesus was a much nicer guy than the, than the Bible tells us. He never said he was the son of God. He said he was a teacher. Mary Magdalene was uh, a disciple. You know, it was, you know, he's suffering. Poor Jesus. <laughs> and Muhammad, whose first wife was a real estate dealer, older than him, richer than him. <laughs> They're all suffering too. <laughs> but we have arrived at a, a system in which religion precedes colonialism, prepares for colonialism, in which religion sanctifies the, the ruling class. Uh, and we have to name it, I believe, and stop pretending that it's off limits. And think once again with the principle of vertical history about a time in which God was present in all living things, in nature, in women and men, equally in all people. Uh, I, I've, I also was distressed to see in my own presidential debates that the, even our two candidates were competing with each other to, to say how religious they, they were, while I was on the sidelines cheering, saying, when are we going to get the first pagan? <laughs> I mean, it just mean, pagan just means nature, you know, it just means, right, right. So I, I, I believe we need to look at our connections to uh, of, of all of these things, our connections to each other without labels, our ability to make circles as we sit in circles in, in this room, uh, our, our profound need to link instead of rank, our um, empowering, as you are doing in this foundation, our empowering of uh, women because we relate to them, not because we don't. Right? It is those kind of connections in which um, I think that we will find the goddess because the goddess is in each of us and certainly she, we, us are the goddess in this room that actually, when you come right down to it, is the only force that is going to save the spaceship Earth that we love so much. Thank you. <laughs>